myself and Alessandra for organizing this uh, fantastic workshop. It's been really wonderful so far, and I'm really looking forward to the rest of the week. And as Google reminded me, today is the spring equinox, so I think we can expect tomorrow to be really, really warm. Um, so this talk is based on, uh, well, the title is based on a couple of papers that I wrote with Aaron Wall over the last couple of years. But really, this spans a body of work starting, uh, well, my work specifically that I'm going to talk about starting in 2015 with some work with Raphael. So this is going to be really starting from the beginning and going all the way to this most recent paper that came out last summer with Aaron Wall on the entropy of pure state black holes and how we got there. Now, of course, the entropy of a pure state anything sounds a little bit like an oxymoron, but let me remind you that black holes must have entropy. Otherwise, you can decrease the entropy of the universe by throwing matter into a black hole. And in the very wise words of Sir Arthur Eddington, if your theory is found to be against the second law of thermodynamics, I can give you no hope. There's nothing for it but to collapse in deepest humiliation. So uh, we don't want that. We would like our theories to not collapse in that deepest humiliation. And oh, sorry, I'll go back. Um, so <coughs> black holes should have entropy. Now, why do we really care? Why are we interested in that more, in a, more globally? And I can only tell you my own motivation for this, which is that gravitational thermodynamics and black hole entropy is really a hint in the IR Lagrangian of gravity about its UV completion. And as such, anything that we can learn about gravitational thermodynamics, about black hole entropy, is going to inform us about the UV completion of gravity, which is something that I think we all would like to know more about. So with that very brief motivation in mind, let me delve right in with the setup of the problem. And then I'll talk about attempts at a solution and uh, finally a resolution in two parts, as well as some applications, extensions, implications, etc. So let's begin with the setup of the problem. So here's the proposal. I think, again, we're all quite familiar with this. Here we have the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. And the proposal is that this is the black hole entropy, which is proportional to the area of the event horizon in Planck units. Now, I always thought that one of the great achievements of Bekenstein and Hawking is to come up with an entropy which you could name after them, and you could also say is the black hole entropy. This was a uh, very nice coincidence. So, uh, so, so this is the proposal. Area of the event horizon is the entropy of the black hole. Now, they, we do have an understanding of this in certain very special cases. There is the strominger waffe argument, and there's also the Ryutakinagi argument. And this is specifically for ADS, for static ADS black holes. And I want to, because this Ryutak and Nagi argument will be important, I wanted to just spend one minute on explaining what that is. So here's ADS Schwarzschild. And here is our bifurcation surface X. Now the Ryutak and Nagi proposal tells us that the area of a surface X, which is homologous to the boundary, and it is the minimal area surface, which is a stationary point of the area functional, also known as an extremal surface, even though it's not actually an extremum, uh, that the area of the surface computes for you the von Neumann entropy of the boundary. So here we can either choose the, um, the left side or the right side. And so we have the area of this bifurcation surface X, which is in fact an extremal surface. It's computing the, the von Neumann entropy of either one. So this is very nice. This is, of course, just the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. And this looks like confirmation of the original proposal. But this, actually, this stationary case is somewhat misleading, actually, because the area of the event horizon is increasing. This is simply the content of the Hawking area theorem, while the von Neumann entropy is conserved under unitary time evolution. So the fact that the two, these two happen to coincide in certain cases is a special situation. It's not going to be the case generically. Now, even worse, a black hole can form from a pure state. <laughs> In this situation, you have an area of the event horizon increasing, but this whole thing is a pure state, so its von Neumann entropy is clearly zero. Not only is it not increasing, it's, it's actually zero. So this raises a very important question. What does the entropy of generic black holes measure, and how do we compute it? And this question is it's, it's quite old. In fact, it is about 45 years old. And until very recently, we didn't actually have the tools to solve it, the tools at least that we used to figure out what the answer to this is. And by we, I mean myself and Aaron Wall. 
Okay, so let's talk about attempts at a solution. We are certainly not the first ones to attempt to solve a 45-year-old problem. And I'll only talk about the most recent attempt to solve it, because it was a bit of a situation where there would be someone attempting to solve it, and then someone else would be saying, no, 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 that's wrong for these reasons, and proposing something else. I'm just going to start with the most recent proposal, which is um, related to a coarse-grained entropy. So we say, okay, we have this pure state black hole. And we want to associate an entropy to it. Well, there is a standard way of doing that in statistical mechanics. We might be given a system in a pure state, but if our knowledge of that state is incomplete, we can define a coarse-grained entropy, which will allow us to have some version of entropy for a pure state. So this particular <coughs> form was proposed by uh, Jaynes in 1957. So suppose we know some data, call it some data D, about the state. This can be anything you like. It can be the expectation values of certain operators, for example. We can maximize the von Neumann entropy over all states with this data. So here's a coarse grain entropy, which is the maximization over all states, over all density matrices rho, with this data fixed. So I'm going to use this notation to denote a maximization of the von Neumann entropy with a fixed data set D. So this here, this is a coarse grain entropy that we can associate to a given data set, even if that data set actually corresponds to a pure state. So what is our expectation if we try to apply this to uh, the black hole case? Well, what we would like, intuitively, is for the black hole entropy to be the coarse grain entropy of our ignorance of the black hole interior, subject to knowing the black hole exterior. So something along the lines of this. So the bekenstein hawking entropy would be equal to a maximization of the von Neumann entropy, subject to keeping the exterior fixed over anything we could possibly stick in the interior that would be consistent with the exterior that we already know. So here's the most recent claim to fame. This is within the context of ADS CFT, but you could really formulate it more generally. So here I have an ADS black hole, and I can define a cross section of the event horizon, sigma of t, in terms of a time slice of the asymptotic boundary. Now, the region between sigma of t and the asymptotic boundary, which is space-like to it, is called the causal wedge. This is actually a slight abuse of terminology, but I'm going to just call this the causal wedge in order to <coughs> introduce additional, uh, the additional nomenclature. So here I have sigma of t. This is just a cross-section of the event horizon, and this is its causal wedge. So this is the region that we want to keep, keep fixed in this coarse-grained entropy picture. We keep this region fixed, and we maximize the von Neumann entropy subject to that fixed region. Intuitively, this is very appealing as far as a coarse-grained entropy that's associated to the black hole, as it m might potentially be the bekenstein hawking entropy. Now, you might, I, I can stand all day here and say how intuitive and how appealing it is, but that doesn't change the fact that it's wrong. Sorry, could you just clarify exactly how Sorry. that wedge is defined? Sorry, where's the question? Oh, yeah, said. How is that wedge defined exactly? So, technically, this is defined as, um, well, okay, so you pick a boundary time slice, and you consider the future of that time slice. So really, the causal wedge usually is really defined in terms of a, of a causal diamond on the boundary. It consists of all points in the bulk that can both send and receive signals from that, uh, from that causal diamond. Here, instead of talk, taking a causal diamond, I'm taking a boundary time slice. Um, I'm not firing. If you're asking whether I'm firing this from, from the bulk or from the boundary, I'm firing it in from the boundary. Okay, so it's the intersection of the, the future of T and the past of infinity. That's right. Okay, so let, let, let's give this proposal in uh, a little bit more detail. So this is due to Will Kelly and Aaron Wall. So the proposal is that the area of sigma of t, which is a Bekenstein-Hawking entropy over 4, is a maximization of the von Neumann entropy subject to keeping the causal wedge fixed. Now, this is also happens to be equal to something that they term the one-point entropy, simply because the, uh, the causal wedge in ADS-CFT can be reconstructed from one-point functions via HKLL. So what you can do, instead of fixing the causal wedge, you can just fix the one-point functions, and that's what they call the one-point entropy. This is a side note. I won't really spend much time on it, but for those of you who are familiar with the construction, this is what it is. So this was the conjecture, that the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy is just this coarse grain entropy fixing the black hole exterior as defined by this causal wedge here and varying the interior. The interior. Now, as I said before, this may be very intuitive, but it's actually wrong. So... Uh, a couple of years ago, Aaron and I were able to come up with a, quite a number of counterexamples and a reason in general why this is just not going to work. 
I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I do want to tell you what the counterexample is. So here we have a situation where we have uh, multiple shells fired into the boundary. These threes and these twos represent patches of Schwarzschild black holes with different masses. This is a cut and paste geometry. And this part of the spacetime over here is just pure ADS. Now if you look at the event horizon of this spacetime, you have this future event horizon here and a past event horizon there. And this here is the bifurcation surface of the two. So the causal wedge of the entire boundary is this region over here. And B is the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy of this surface here. So B is the, is the surface here, which is sigma of T for the entire boundary, where T, we take T to past infinity. So of course, B here is quite clear, has non-zero area. But B also lives in this pure ADS region. And we can't actually put anything behind in the interior of B, which is not pure ADS. This is just rigidity, yeah, Rafael. You really mean bifurcation surface? So I'm actually mean intersection of the past and future horizons. I don't mean um, an extremal surface, it's not. Um, yeah. So we can't put any, any, any space time behind B which is not pure ADS because of rigidity. This means that, this, that B, the exterior of B is actually only consistent with one single interior. And that single interior is a pure state meaning that the one-point entropy of this space-time, if we maximize subject to keeping this fixed, we have, we're left with only one state, which is a pure state, and has zero von Neumann entropy. And therefore, this coarse grain entropy that we defined, this, um, this entropy over here, actually vanishes for this space-time, even though the area of B is non-zero. So we, we have a, this counterexample, this beautiful proposal, and in fact, we came up with quite a few counterexamples showing that this is, in fact, not right. So it looks like we're back at square one, unfortunately. We are back at zero for understanding the issue of black hole entropy for non-stationary black holes. So this, this gives us, in some sense, an alternative. Either we shouldn't be coarse graining over our ignorance of the black hole exterior, which is very unfortunate, or we should rethink what we mean by the black hole exterior. Now, this former option really is not going to work because Aaron and I were actually also able to show that coarse graining over information, which is either finer than the set of two-point functions or coarser than the set of one-point functions or coarser than the set of one-point functions, is still not going to work. So your only hope is if you do want to coarse grain over something which is not the black hole exterior, you're going to have to find something which is incomparable to the set of one-point functions or incomparable to the causal wedge. And that seems to be a, quite a significant departure from what we mean by the entropy associated to a black hole. <clears throat> so this leaves us with a potential option here, which is that perhaps we should rethink what we mean by the black hole exterior. It turns out that there are other issues with defining the black hole exterior in terms of event horizons. And this is what I'm going to go to through next. Why there are many other reasons why maybe we don't want to think about the black hole exterior as defined in terms of event horizons. Yeah, there was a question. Yeah, so what's your criteria for deciding if something works or not? So you're saying this doesn't work or? I mean, you can find counterexamples. Well, OK, but I guess I think of entropy as is, is, being a bit observer dependent. So someone might describe something as a pure state, mm -hmm. and for them it, it is a pure state because they can do certain things with it, and someone, and where's the prescription that you're using um, where you're maximizing the entropy with some fixed things, that's you know, useful for a different notion of entropy where, or a different observer. That's right, you could sense. say maybe there's a different notion of, of coarse grained entropy which, which we haven't covered. Um, this is kind of what I mean by coarse graining over, we can't coarse grain over information which is either finer than or coarser than the causal wedge. You can imagine doing, co coming up with a completely different prescription. Right. Um, I have nothing to say about that other than this seems like the most natural one and it doesn't work. Okay, but your criteria for it doesn't work means you have a definition of entropy. I mean, we have a precise definition and it does not equal the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. Okay, so the, your criteria is it needs to equal the... Well, uh, the, the whole point of this is to def explain what is the origin of the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. Okay. What is the entropy of a black hole? That's right. Yeah. I mean, because I might say that when, you know, I might say the entropy of a, a Bekenstein-Hawking black hole is, is, can be zero if it's a pure state and, and not be bothered with that because for well, a certain observer it is and the fact that it doesn't match. Well, so, so in the beginning point. I talked about how black holes have to have entropy. They have to have quantum gravity microstates. If you, um, if you throw stuff into the black hole then the entropy of the universe decreases, then you have a problem. 
Um, I, I think there was. Sorry. Yeah, maybe this is for discussion. Yeah, yeah. That, that's. Yes, sir. I, I think I missed something exceedingly basic. I th I thought you wanted coarse grain over the interior. That's right. So when I so say why are you writing coarse graining over the exterior? So I, sorry, when I say coarse grain here, I meant um, over. This is a poor choice of word. I meant while fixing. Coarse so graining while fixing the one point functions. Coarse graining while fixing the causal wedge. This right, so this word over should not be here. Coarse grain over yes. all the interior. Okay, good. So I'm coarse graining over all the interior, subject to fixing the exterior. Excellent. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I should use this. Uh, there are different things you could or different ways you could define an entropy. So for example, there's a Bekenstein-Hawking-like formula if you just take you know, flat space and draw a sphere, mm -hmm. right, and say what is the von Neumann entropy associated with you know, uh, tracing out uh, over the degrees of freedom inside the sphere. So uh, you have to be careful about you know, how you're, well, what you're using as your definition. So Absolutely. why shouldn't I, you know, I can just as well write down a Bekenstein Hawking formula in that case. So, you know, why should I uh, then think there is a different story in the black hole case? Or, you know, how how are you going to? Uh, well, so so here, I'm not. I'm certainly not claiming that I have excluded all possible ways of thinking about entropy of a black hole. I'm simply putting forward a very natural notion of how we might have wanted to do it, and showing that it doesn't work. But you know, if you're trying to explain what Bekenstein Hawking is telling you, mm -hmm. uh, then you know there, there's an explanation, again, just in the context of a flat background, which is based on computing the von Neumann entropy in the way I just described. It has nothing to do with black holes. So when you say the Bekenstein Hawking entropy uh, for a flat background, what exactly do you mean by that? If I draw a surface in a flat background mm -hmm. and ask. Uh, you know, what is the entropy associated with, you know, tracing out the region inside the you surface? You generalized entropy. I think we don't call it Bekenstein-Hawking entropy, unless it's really... There, there you don't call it Bekenstein-Hawking, yeah. but it's the, the same formula. It's the area and, you know, whatever. Saying, kind of you, you call it the generalized entropy. Maybe okay. that will help with the communication. I can, okay. Ah, very good. Okay, yeah. So, so there is a way of getting an area formula that looks just like Bekenstein-Hawking that has nothing to do with black hole states. Mm -hmm. So uh, the question is, well, so there are different ways of defining. You know, but but also that is talking about a coarse grain entropy. What you're talking about is fine grain. You're fine. That's fine. Well, oh, I, I think I understand Steve's question. <laughs> no, I'm going to trace out what's inside to give a von Neumann entropy. Yeah, yeah, if you're in yeah. Pure vacuum, yeah. The interior state is fixed. Well, no, that calculation has been done, right? You take the Minkowski vacuum, you draw an area, you trace out the internal degrees of freedom, and you get the an entropy of von Neumann entropy, which is the area in cutoff units, whatever you use as your cutoff. I think the rules of the game are not totally clear here. Yeah, you, 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 want to find, you want to find a way. Of I agree. Yeah, no, but I think they're clear to Neta. Uh, <laughs> One point she made, right, is if you actually do this in ADS, if you trace out some part of, of the bulk, I mean, if you just cut out some part of the bulk, but it's in the vacuum of ADS, you're able to tell from infinity that it's in the vacuum of the ADS, so you've actually lost no information by doing so. Right? There's, no, there's only one state that is compatible with the behavior at infinity of the metric, and so you've actually lost no information. And so it's, it's subtle to try to understand in which case in an actual quantum theory of gravity you can associate a coarse grain set of states to an area. And, and so the answer may not be that you can do it for every choice of surface. In fact, so far we were only able to do it for HRT surfaces. And now Neda is going to tell us how to do it for other types of surfaces, but not for every surface. And the fact that you can't seemingly do it for every surface is, I think, interesting. Well, I, I should let her continue. All right. I mean, if, if, if your black hole event horizon happened to always be foliated by extremal surfaces, then it would have been in a very good position, but uh, it's not. Anyway, yeah, I think I...
I, I, I think part of it is that if, if you just have this region in the middle of flat space, then you can tell that it's empty if you measure the energy outside, right? You, you see that the gravitational field I mean, is so It's a gravitational rigidity theorem, yeah. Right, so I think that was, that's part of the point the that Meadows was making. This what, sorry? The energy has to appear. Yes, yes exactly, yeah. Well, so in the argument, well, we use the gravitational rigidity theorem. That's right. Yeah. Right. yeah. I have a technical question. What, no, it's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what is the, quant the geometric quantity of the 1.5 and 2.5? You said that those working with them doesn't change the formula. Can you say so the, 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 the geometric quantity of the 1.5 and 2.5? Geometrically, what does it mean to change <coughs> The one point function, what does it mean to change the two point function? So I don't know when I commented on this, but um, oh, you, you, did I did I, did I, did I talk about this with the one point entropy? It's really tangential to the talk. So I, why don't we talk about it during the discussion? Okay, so hopefully I've uh, well, clearly stimulated a lot of discussion. But what I would like to move on to now is the the situation where we know that we have these two options, one of them probably doesn't work, so we're starting to look at redefining what we mean by the black hole exterior. So this is the first part of the resolution. We replace the event horizon by a different type of surface that is going to actually allow us to have this nice interpretation of the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy. So let's recall what the black hole event horizon is, since I'm going to be picking at this definition. So a black hole is defined <coughs> as a region of space-time that can't send light rays to any future infinite observer. And the boundary of this region is called the event horizon. Connected boundary of this region is called the event horizon. In particular, this definition immediately implies that the event horizon cannot be observed by any, any observer at finite time. And it also doesn't exist if there's no asymptotic future. So this gives us a list of drawbacks. First, entropy isn't defined even if, if there is no asymptotic future. And of course, we have no way of determining whether there is or is not an asymptotic future at any finite time. Meaning that if we live in a universe that sometime in a distant future has a big crunch, we can't even talk about black holes. No matter how much we think we may see a black hole, it actually isn't a black hole because that's not even defined without an asymptotic boundary. Now, even if there is an asymptotic boundary, which again, we have no way of knowing, the entropy of a black hole now shouldn't depend on what kind of matter is going to fall into it in the future, 10 million years from now. This is a very uncomfortable a causality, if we're talk especially if we want to associate to an event horizon any kind of notion of thermodynamics. This is uh, called the black hole teleology problem, and it's been studied quite a bit. And finally, it gets worse. Even when we do have an asymptotic boundary in, say, a flat cosmology, we actually still don't have an event horizon. And we certainly would like to have a notion of gravitational entropy of something like an expanding universe. So all of these suggest that other than the fact that we don't have a good interpretation of the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy, if we define it in terms of the event horizon, there are other problems uh, to thinking about thermodynamics in terms of event horizons. So let's construct the wish list for what we want for our new horizons. So there are things that we don't want to give up, things that are really nice about event horizons that we want to preserve, like, for example, the fact that they capture a notion of light being trapped. We do not want to give this up. That said, we don't want this notion to depend on the asymptotic future. We would like this notion to only depend on something on quantities which are local in time. We would like these to exist in generic space times, including in cosmologies. And of course, in the situations where we do understand black hole entropy, we would like the two to coincide. So we want these to include event horizons for stationary black holes. Here's one, probably the most important bit, which is that the area had better be proportional to a coarse-grained entropy of the exterior, so coarse-graining over the interior. This is what we were not able to resolve in, uh, in event horizons, and we would like this for a new definition. Now, of course, we would like to also have a second law of thermodynamics, meaning that we would like this area to satisfy a broadly applicable area theorem. This is a lot to ask for. This is a list of, this is a wish list and very fanciful, and you might say, oh, okay, maybe it's kind of a fantasy. But I find it rather remarkable that we were actually able to find an object that satisfies all of the above. And this is what I'm going to spend the rest of the talk telling you about. So let's begin with a local notion of light being trapped. So let's take a surface S, co dimension two surface S. There are two ways we can fire light from it. We can fire light outwards to the future and inwards to the future. 
And these two, these generate two null hypersurfaces. So this one is the outwards one, and this one is the ingoing one. Now, our approximately flat-space intuition tells us that the outgoing one has to have expanding area. It's expanding in cross-sectional area. And the ingoing one is contracting in cross-sectional area. This is an approximately flat-space intuition, which does not necessarily continue to hold in curved space. So near a black hole singularity or very close to a big crunch, space-time volume contracts. So we may have a situation where the outgoing light rays are contracting as well as the ingoing light rays. And these types of surfaces where both, light, both families of light rays are contracting are called trapped surfaces. Now, right after a Big Bang singularity or a white hole singularity, space-time volume expands very rapidly. So we expect that we would find surfaces where the outgoing light rays are expanding and the ingoing light rays are expanding as well. So we call these very creatively anti-trapped surfaces. Now, I'm going to go in a very intuitive and vague here, but if we think of a black hole as being populated by trapped surfaces, and we think of the outside of a black hole as being populated by normal surfaces, then there's an intuitive sense in which we, can want, we may want to think of the boundary as consisting of surfaces where the outgoing light rays are neither contracting nor expanding. And these are known as marginally trapped surfaces. We can apply the same intuition for cosmology to talk about marginally anti-trapped surfaces. So this leads me to the definition of past-future holographic screens, which are really a refinement of something that Raphael defined back in 99, which were just plain holographic screens. So a future holographic screen is a surface that can be foliated by marginally trapped surfaces, S of R. R here is an index of the foliation. So this blue surface here is a holographic screen. And these S of R are surfaces which are foliating this holographic screen. In other words, every point on this holographic screen lies precisely on one of these marginally trapped surfaces. So this is a future holographic screen. You can just as easily define a past holographic screen just as being foliated by marginally anti-trapped surfaces. So this is a, bunch, a lot of definitions. Let me now give you an example of how to construct this. This is adapted from uh, Raphael's paper in 99. So here we have a collapsing star. And we can imagine we have an observer here holding a flashlight falling into the black hole. Here is along r equals zero. Now, we have a pulse of light coming out. What happens to this light cone is it ends up uh, making it out to infinity. So effectively, we think of it as just expanding all the way out to infinity. Now, as our observer moves along, these light rays still start out by expanding. But eventually, they're going to contract. So it looks more something like this. This is just a cartoon, of course. But it looks roughly something like this. It's expanding here, and eventually, it's contracting. And we can keep moving. This, basically, this picture is basically applicable for any one of these families of light rays. Now what this means is that at some point, there is a cross-section of this where the area is neither expanding nor contracting. This is a stationary point, since it started by expanding and ended by contracting. So I've marked these points on these congruences over here. Taking the union of these gives us a holographic screen. So this here is this holographic screen, which is time-like in the region inside the star and space-like in the region outside the star. And for smoothness purposes, I'm assuming there's a little bit of matter falling in at all times. And here's an example of a past holographic screen in a flat cosmology. So we have a, there's a oh. Are you requiring that the ingoing congruence has positive convergence? Or is that? Is it just a condition on the outgoing one? Uh, that, sorry, that the ingoing, zero? you mean, um, so, so you're talking about one of these marginally trapped surfaces? Right. So we are actually, we are requiring that this be zero, and the ingoing one has negative expansion everywhere. So in a generic geometry. I mean, not every surface is going to satisfy that property, right. for sure. So couldn't but you sort you of could, just not have that anywhere? This is an Oppenheimer Schneider geometry, which is spherically symmetric. But um, right. in general, yeah. In general, you have to, not every surface is going to have this nice, all of these nice properties. Not yeah, every marginally trapped surface is going to have these nice properties. Right, but would a generic geometry even possess a future holographic screen yeah, if we it, expect it was so. a collapse type geometry? If it was sufficiently inhomogeneous, inside it might not have any. So, so generically, um, for instance, the space like component, the outermost space like component of a holographic screen is going to be a. Um, foliated by parent horizons, which you can construct by looking at Cauchy slices, and, they, and those exist for a good choice of a foliation. The outermost 
Wait, so you're saying you can construct it always using a foliation? If it's well, at least the, the, I mean, there exist, certainly exist foliations that do not contain marginally trapped surfaces, but you would expect that in general for generic geometry you can come up with a foliation which will. Under small perturbations, that that the ingoing congruence has negative expansion, because it's it's like it's bounded away from zero in, in, to start with. Well, so, small perturbations of this very symmetrical setup. Yeah, so now it's not symmetrical. So I mean, that's the usual notion of generic, right? That, that it's not like a, a set of measures zero in the solutions. So it's not that. There's yeah, an open was, set of solutions that that around this, this one. Yeah. Yeah. But who cares around what? Well, I care. I, I, I care. I want to. I mean, it's not surprising definition. that that open set contain, contains a symmetric, symmetric case, um, but but if you if you have a very very asymmetric space time, uh, there are evolution equations for these holographic screens, and you can impose the condition that you want uh, the ingoing congruence to to um, to remain having negative curvature. The, the reason that this is relevant is that the evolution of the holographic screens has an enormous amount of freedom in it because you have so much choice in the choice of slicing. So there's a lot of different null slicings of these space times, and each one of them is going to lead to some holographic screen. And by by, ch so if you want to impose the additional condition that that it, it be a future holographic screen that's going to restrict the type of slicings you can consider, and I think it'd be a very interesting question uh, to look at whether you have enough freedom there. Uh, and so I think it's a good question whether whether you could still do it for highly asymmetric <laughs> space times. Okay, and so is the part of what Raphael just said that um, a given black hole would generically possess many different. Yes, absolutely, they're highly not. And unique. they would would they generally intersect each other? Um, they wouldn't intersect on an actual marginally trapped surfaces. They could intersect on um, if they don't intersect on a margin on a full marginally trapped surface. So if you imagine you have maybe I'll go back up. Um, yes, yeah, see, they wouldn't possess a common. A common uh, slice. They would not. No, this was, there was a proof of this right. by, um, I think it was Ashton Carr and Galloway who proved this. And one other question. So, I mean, a totally non-slice dependent definition I might think of trying to come up with is to say um, any point in space time either is or isn't on some marginally outer trapped surface. And I could consider the region in space time of points that are on one and then take the boundary of that region. Well, it's not obvious to me that that boundary is, I mean, you look at this sort of like the outer envelope of all holographic screens. Not holographic screens, just of all co-dimension to, all points that sit on some co-dimension to marginally outer trapped surface. Um, you could, you, I, I, I worry that this might actually coincide with, um, in certain cases this might coincide with the event horizon, I think. But that wouldn't be a bad thing. Uh, well, let, let's talk about it during the discussion. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so here's an example of a past holographic screen. So here the area is increasing towards the future. So this is in this direction. These are uh, marginally anti-trapped. So this is an expanding direction, and this is a stationary direction. So let's, uh, let's take a look at our wish list and how we're doing. So we certainly have managed to capture a notion of light being trapped inside a black hole only depends on data which is local in time. These exist in generic space times. I guess we maybe have established that. Um, these include event horizons and stationary black holes. For example, the event horizon of Schwarzschild is just foliated by these, by um, marginally trapped surfaces, so it is a holographic screen. And this situation is, of course, valid in those cases where the event horizon entropy is accounted for simply because, in those cases, the event horizon and holographic screens coincide. But, of course, we're not actually doing that much better than we did with the event horizon because we still have to solve these two questions. And, in fact, for the event horizons, we knew there was an area law, and it looks like in this case we still, have, we still don't know that. Except uh, we do. So this was a theorem that Rafael and I proved uh, in 2015, that the area of cross-sections of a holographic screen increase monotonically as you evolve along a holographic screen. No matter how many times it transitions its signature, the area will always be monotonically increasing. 
Uh, and in fact, I find it rather amusing that the first, uh, the first talk I ever gave on this, I gave at a workshop that Steve organized. Um, so this is, by the way, under assumption of the null energy condition as well as a certain generic condition. So we have this area theorem, and this confirms that what we want, that these are very similar to hot two event horizons, and they have all of these nice properties. And I want to emphasize this is a really non-trivial statement, because these holographic screens are not always null. They don't have, always have the same signature that event horizons do. These can behave in many interesting ways and change, change their signatures, and yet they still have this area monotonicity property. So, so it's not backwards, so it's, mo it's monotonic along the, event hor the holographic screen. So you're always evolving monotonically along it. It's backwards in time, but it's monotonic along the screen. That's right, that's right. Um, okay, so we have a check mark on this, which just leaves us with this number five over here. So all we have to do is to solve a 45-year-old problem, and then we're done. So let's begin with the resolution part two, the entropy of um, black holes. So what is it we want? Let's remind ourselves of what, what we, how we started this in the first place, the question that we were asking. We want an entropy which is associated to our ignorance in the interior of the black hole, subject to a complete knowledge of the exterior of the black hole. Now, of course, we're thinking of the, ex we're gonna think of the exterior of the black hole as the exterior of a marginally trapped surface S. So we want our ignorance of the region inside a slice of the holographic screen subject to our knowledge of the region outside of this. So this is the outside region, this is the inside region, this is just a 3D version of the interior. And well, we want this entropy. So this is a coarse grain entropy which we associate with S, which is a maximization of the von Neumann entropy over all possible interiors of S, so subject to keeping the exterior of S fixed. Yeah? Shouldn't you be worried that now your region includes why? Close to I'm not worried. Well, I mean, <laughs> that, that's your choice, but now, you, I mean, close to the singularity, you know, semi-classical gravity will not hold anymore. This is true. So, I mean, what are the rules of the game then? Well, um, the rules of the game are for now, I'm going to, to just work in the GR in a semi-classical limit, and then when we figure this out, then we can start worrying about quantum gravity. Yeah. Don't spoil the ending. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, I mean, if you assume that the quantum gravity has deterministic equations of motion, then you can fix the data over here, and that'll fix for you the data in the, in the interior over here, and that's enough to um, fix whatever goes on over there. Yeah. Can I ask you a possibly related confusion? I mean, normally when we think of um, when I want to compute the entropy, I mean, I think of that as the entropy of a state, which means that I need to pick a Cauchy slice. And so I, I would normally think of, I would have some slice in these regions, and then I trace So the, this is the entropy of the boundary. On the boundary, ah, okay. We're maximizing the boundary entropy. This is the von Neumann entropy of the boundary theory. Because okay. you still have some slice on the boundary, and, and then... Th that's right. I mean, okay. on the boundary, you just take any, any slice you want. Yeah. I say, okay, good, then I see why you're not. Okay, good. Thank you. Yeah, all right. And now, the, now the outside means the domain of dependence of a partial of Cauchy. That's right. So we're going to make an assumption here, which is that S is homologous to the boundary, so that we actually have a good definition of what that means. Yeah. Actually, uh, coming back to my earlier question. So at this point, I could say I'm going to draw a slice uh, mm -hmm. through that point, and I'm going to consider some quantum fields moving on this space-time, yeah. and I'm going to do the same kind of calculation we described in mm -hmm. flat space and trace over, you know, in some, say, in the unruh vacuum or something, trace over the degrees of freedom inside, and I get an area law entropy. Sure. And so that's one explanation of something that looks like the bekenstein hawking entropy, and this is a different explanation, well, and so the question is, what is the relation? You're not including gravitational um, macro states when you do that. So yeah. we, you're not, here we're, we're talking about our ignorance of all of the physics over here, and that has to include the gravity. I could be summing, for example, over at least, you know, small gravitational fluctuations and maybe big ones. But, but we're, con we're considering literally any space-time you could stick in this region, and I think that's the right thing to consider here, because you're talking about your ignorance of what goes on behind the black hole interior, which includes, includes the geometry, non-perturbatively. 
Okay, but I, okay, so there are quantum fields propagating on that background. Well, so I, I'm, not, I'm not working in that, in that limit right now. No, no, but, but, there, in but general, there are. Yes. There are quantum fields plus geometry, mm -hmm. and so I could calculate the entropy that I just described, and there's also the entropy that you just described. So what, what is the relation? Should I be adding them or, you know? So, so good. So this is something that I'll comment on at the end, the, the issue of the entropy of the, field, of the bulk fields right now. I'm working in the classical limit, but I will comment on this at the end, okay? This is related to uh, an upcoming paper, which is, uh, I think, coming out. I guess the authors are all here. Uh, Raphael, Ven, and Arvin. And uh, I'll, I'll comment a little bit on it at the end. Yeah. Are you giving up at all the idea that the information should come out of the interior? Um, I am, so I'm, I'm working just purely in the classical limit here. So I'm not talking about Hawking radiation at any point. But you're talking about information. I'm talking about the von Neumann entropy of the boundary theory here. So the quantum, the von Neumann entropy here only comes in at the boundary, at the level of the CFT, not in the bulk. Okay? But the question is, it should also come out. If the black hole shrinks, it, it loses entropy. So the entropy should But I, I'm not working in that regime. I might, I'm, I'm not so ambitious. I'm not trying to explain the black, black hole evaporation. I'm purely talking about black hole entropy in the classical limit right now. We can talk, so when I comment on, uh, on, on Steve's question, we can also talk about the, the, the situation where the black holes are, um, are, are, have a quantum back reaction as well. Nana, can you clarify that statement? Y you said twice now that you're talking about a boundary entropy. Yeah. Are, is it going to come up later what boundary entropy you're talking about? Or? So if you ask me during the q and I have some backup slides okay. prepared on that, yeah. Okay, so let's, uh, let's be a little bit more precise here. Sorry, this is so sm appearing so small. So I'm going to just give this region a name here. This is the outer wedge of S, and here we're assuming that S is homologous to the boundary. And we call the outer, the, the entropy which is associated with our, to our ignorance of the interior of S, the outer entropy. So this is the maximization of the von Neumann entropy of the boundary theory, subject to keeping the outer wedge fixed. Okay, so we're going to also specialize further for our construction to a certain subset of the holographic screen. So roughly speaking, this is the outermost space-like component of the holographic screen. If you want a definition which is independent of this holographic screen business, we're going to, we call, we are, this is the definition, we call the mini-mar surfaces. So every surface, so a surface is mini-mar, a marginally trapped surface is mini-mar. If there exists a Cauchy slice, of its exterior of this outer wedge, such that every surface that circumscribes, circumscribes S has area larger than it. And it also has to be strictly stable. Uh, this, roughly speaking, is the statement that if you slightly deform S outwards, there exists a deformation which gives you a normal surface. So this is something mathematicians like to talk about, this strict stability. <coughs> and in fact, this is uh, it's always satisfied on space-like components of future holographic screens. So we're going to restrict to these ones for now, and I'll make a couple of comments on uh, possibly removing some assumptions or what might happen if we try to do that. So under these assumptions, Aaron and I were able to prove that the outer entropy of the surface S, which again is this coarse graining over all possible interiors, is exactly the area of S over 4 in Planck units. S here is a minimar surface or a slice of the outermost space-like component of a uh, holographic screen. Yes? Just a quick question. Sorry if I missed it before, too. But um, it's with respect to, um, just on the previous slide, um, a particular foliation, so the sigma is a particular foliation of Cauchy surfaces, or does it have to be for any? For any. For any one. Yeah, but for only a particular Cauchy slice, not all Cauchy slices. There exists a Cauchy slice, so this is true. Okay, so there just has to exist one Cauchy slice. Yeah, so... If, you, um, if you're familiar with Aaron's maximin construction, this is true for any HRT surface on a full Cauchy slice. Here we're requiring something a little bit, a lot milder, which is that it's true for on a partial Cauchy slice for these. Okay, so this is what we're able to show. And of course, I'm not expecting you to take it on faith, so I will provide a proof. Was there a question? Yeah? So if I, if I say I have a record of what's inside, how would you have a record of what's inside? Well, because I formed it. So if I, if I say, create the black hole, I keep a record of exactly <coughs> what the state was. So, so then then leave it outside we're only the fixing hole. this data. So well, anything that was thrown in the black hole over here, we are not fixing that data. You do not have access to it. No, no, but I can keep a record of what I, a copy of what I threw in. 
Well, but that means that you have saying. access to data from th this past region over here. We're, we're, we're not allowing that. We're fixing only this region. And it, this region cannot causally propagate into the interior of S. So it's not possible for you to keep a record of anything if all you have is access to this data over here. Everything else is being modified, is allowed to be modified. You see, I can't take a shell of dust where I know exactly the state, write down what that state is. No, it's not because it, outside in order for that to tell you anything about the interior, it has to happen in the past over here by causality. And you don't have access to this past. You only have access to everything, to the future of this. That's by construction. But isn't that record persisting into the future? Well, not, not it's like asking if I give you, if, if I have a box and I know what quantum state is in it, yes. right, and I wrote it down, yes. I can still work out what entropy somebody would assign to that box who doesn't have my record, and this is how you would work it out. Yes, so I agree. I think that <coughs> that, that's, sure. that's, that's the question that's being answered here. That doesn't mean that you have to forget everything. You can choose not to. Yeah, it's a coarse graining. In, not, not in that this, th there are... Yeah. Okay, I guess I would say it's not quite it's not quite Gainesian in the sense that I'm not necessarily course grading over, you know, if I have some data outside, I'm going to ignore it. There's some that you seem to want to ignore, which is it's 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 Jane's inspired. Yeah. I didn't understand how you defined the right hand side here. You said this is a boundary entropy, so are you so this right, so right boundary? now in its current state, it's a bulk it's a bulk boundary hybrid. Um, there, I'm maximizing a boundary quantity subject to keeping a bulk quantity fixed. If you like, we can write this purely in terms of a bulk quantity by replacing the Vonemann entropy here by the area of the HRT surface. So you could imagine what we're doing here instead is we're maximizing the area of the HRT surface over all possible geometries which have the same outer wedge and different inner wedges. Okay, thanks. Yeah. All right. So is, is, yeah. Um, now you're talking about a result that follows from assumption that you have a minimar. That's right. And that's independent mm -hmm. of the previous discussion, which was the feature holographic screen. So it's not independent in the following sense. Um, the outermost space that component of a holographic screen is, is, is foliated by minimar surfaces. So they provide an example of it. That's right. You don't need to invoke the concept of a feature holographic screen. You don't, you don't need to. The reason I did it, as you will see later, is that this, uh, this has a nice connection with the area theorem, and it gives us a way of thinking about why <coughs> these are preferred, why are these interesting surfaces to think about um, from the perspective of uh, gravitational thermodynamics. Okay, so roughly speaking, what this is telling you is that the area of the admittedly quasi-local black hole horizon is the maximum entropy that is consistent with its exterior. And I would say this is precisely the statement that we've been working towards all along in trying to understand the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy of a black hole. Now, I don't expect you to take this for granted, so I'm going to give you a very short sketch of the proof of this statement. So, first of all, here we have the statement that we, I think we all know and love, which is the area of the HRT surface X in any asymptotically ADS spacetime computes the von Neumann entropy. And what we do is that we prove in any classical spacetime that we can put behind our minimar surface S, in other words, any spacetime which is consistent with our fixed exterior, the area of the HRT surface is bounded from above by the area of S. So this is true for any spacetime, no matter what we stick behind the surface S, as long as this is consistent with the, uh, with the constraint equations. The way we do this is by combination of focusing and by applying Aaron Wall's maximin formalism. Yeah, Andrea? Yeah, Sorry, what was that? Uh, so we're working purely classically here, if this is your question. This is, we're, we're fixing just a classical, the leading order contribution to the Ryutaki and Ange formula. And the interior has to be smooth. You're only gluing smooth space times. Like We're only including space times which satisfy the constraint equations, which do require certain junction conditions, which do not allow you to just have a jump in the metric. Yeah. So what this shows is that the outer entropy, which again is the maximization of the von Neumann entropy over, over all possible interiors of our given outer wedge, is going to be less than or equal to the area of S over 4GH bar. So this we can establish by a very simple argument using just focusing and this maximum construction. And then what we do is we construct the space time in which this is precisely saturated. And that, of course, proves that the outer entropy is equal to the area of S over 4. So this is the space time that we construct, which is the maximizing geometry. So here, this is the exterior of S, the outer wedge, which we do not modify. 
And the way we construct the spacetime is we just provide an initial data surface. So the initial data surface we provide is this red surface over here. This is a null hypersurface, and we specify the initial data that we want on it. The initial data we want, in particular, implies that this is a stationary hypersurface, meaning that the area of S and the area of X, which I haven't told you what X is, but the area of S and the area of any slice X of this will, have, will be identical, because this is stationary. Now, the initial data that we provide actually also tells us that X is an extremal surface. And we then construct the rest of the space-time by doing a CPT conjugation around X. So this is just a CPT conjugate of that. In this new space-time, we're able to prove that not only is this surface extremal and homologous to one boundary, but it is also the minimal area surface in this space the minimal area extremal surface in this space-time, which is homologous to one boundary meaning that this is the HRT surface in this space-time. And of course, since this is a stationary surface, the area of this and the area of that are identical, meaning that the area of this, and therefore the area of that, is the von Neumann entropy in this space-time, which is precisely the statement that we wanted. The maximum is attained, and the maximum is the area of S. Let me just say a few words about this initial data that we put on this red hypersurface. So, we specify, so this is, we're going to call it n minus k. So the idea here, I drew these arrows before. This is going to, the stationary direction is k. The contracting direction is l. These details are a little technical, so if you want to just snooze for a few moments, that's fine. Um, so n minus k is this null, this, the, the surface that was read before. Minus k because we're firing it towards the past. So here's our surface s. This is the purple surface over here. And lambda here is an affine parameter along n minus k. So lambda equals 0 is our surface s, where the, exp the k expansion vanishes and the l expansion is negative. Now, because our surface is actually strictly stably outermost, we know that, we, by assumption, that this thing is going to be negative for some parameterization of l. And in particular, the choice of initial data that we have, that I haven't fully specified here, but our choice of initial data guarantees that on constant slices of this affine parameter, this is going to be preserved. So we start out with theta L negative, and then theta L is going to decrease as we evolve towards the future along this no congruence, meaning it increases as we evolve towards the past. So this suggests that somewhere here, we're going to find a surface where theta L is exactly zero, and I've drawn it over here. It doesn't have to be a constant affine slice, and in fact, it generally won't be. But it suggests that such a surface should exist. And if so, theta L equals 0 and theta K equals 0 together is a definition of an extremal surface. So how do we know that the surface actually exists as opposed to just saying it stands to reason that it does? And this is actually, a, I would call it a fairly rigorous mathematical proof. So you can actually write down the location of x in terms of all of these quantities in this, on this null hypersurface. This is the equation for the location of, X, of S. V here is a, trend, is a coordinate on the surface, so saying V equals F of Y, that gives you the location of X. And L is an elliptic operator. So this is actually known as the stability operator in math literature. And it turns out that this thing is invertible whenever S is strictly stable. This was proved by a series of mathematicians. So this equation actually has a solution. And the solution has v less than 0, meaning that the extremal surface lies here as opposed to somewhere over here, which would be a problem for our construction. So the surface exists. We can write down its location so we know where to do the CPT conjugation. And it lies exactly where we need it to lie in the past region as opposed to in the future. Now just a brief aside here, just uh, some self-advertising. So it turns out that this vector, uh, this operator L actually is incredibly useful. <coughs> And a vector generalization of it can help you learn a lot of interesting things in uh, ADS-CFT about causality and uh, extremal surfaces. So upcoming paper with Sebastian Fischetti will uh, expand on that. OK, so all together, what do we have? There, we know that there exists a space-time, which we just constructed, where the outer wedge, O, W of S, this is fixed. We haven't modified it. Whose CFT dual, which I'll call rho 1, satisfies this equation. Sorry, there should be a GH bar over here. Now, since we've already shown that for any state rho with a CFT dual containing this outer wedge, this von Neumann entropy is smaller than the area of S over 4, the fact that there exists a state where it's saturated immediately means that the two are actually equal. So this outer entropy, this coarse grain entropy, 
is exactly the area of S over 4, the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy of the black hole. Just to be clear, to follow mm -hmm. the logic, it, so when you say the von Neumann entropy, you mean the von Neumann entropy as computed using the HRT formula? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So, so this assumes the HRT assuming. proposal. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So here's back to our, our wish list. Look at that. Everything is green. Um, so we've, we've, said we've done everything we've wanted to do with the caveat that our formula is valid for the outermost space-like component of holographic screens, and I haven't said anything about the time-like component. Sorry, what was the question? Yeah. So th that's that's. If you give me one moment, I will get to that. That's the, literally the, like the next slide. Um, Okay, so applications, uh, extensions and implications. So the first one uh, was just anticipated, the explanation of the area law. So let's for a moment consider a holographic screen which is purely space-like everywhere. These happen actually, these are fairly generic. And we know that the area increases in this outwards direction along the holographic screen. So we now have this explanation for the origin of the entropy, or the, and we, would we have this area law. We would like to connect the two into a law of thermodynamics. And indeed, it's exactly what we see. So <coughs> let's forget the, about the area law altogether. Suppose we don't know anything about the area law. We don't know there's a monotonic area increase. Let's just take a look at what we know about the outer entropy. Well, the outer entropy of this over here is a maximization of the Vonemann entropy subject to keeping this outer wedge fixed, this large region over here. And that's a large set of constraints. Now, and that is equal to the area of this point one over here. Now we move on to point two, the second mini Mars surface that's further along the holographic screen. Now we're maximizing the Neumann entropy, subject to fewer constraints. This wedge lies strictly inside that one. So we would expect that the entropy goes up, which means we expect that the area of the surface goes up, and similarly over here. So just by knowing that the area is equal to the Neumann entropy, to, the, to this coarse grain entropy, we can immediately say this must satisfy an area theorem because the entropy has to be increasing since we're maximizing subject to progressively fewer constraints. And so this strange space-like area law that we had known about beforehand actually turns out to be a law of thermodynamics. If you think about it, we're literally just looking at entropies which are progressively more coarse-grained as we evolve further along the holographic screen. If you want to, you can turn it into a statement about entropies in terms of time if you translate this just back to the boundary. Um, sorry, there a question? Okay. Um, okay, so now another application I wanted to, uh, to talk about because it came up earlier in the conference is this Penrose inequality. So this was briefly discussed on Monday, and Raphael mentioned it briefly. Now the Penrose inequality is a conjecture that the area of apparent horizons is bounded by the ADM mass. So it's considered to be a test of cosmic centership. And in four-dimensional asymptotically flat space, this is roughly the statement, that the, um, the ADM mass is larger than this function over here. Or equivalently, the area of uh, sorry, sigma here, is, S is meant to be an apparent horizon, is less than the area of a static black hole with mass m. Now, if we think of this as a mini Mars surface, if we further impose that, we can ask, well, now we know what the area is. We know what the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy of this is. Can we use that to prove a Penrose inequality in ADS-CFT as evidence of cosmic censorship in ADS-CFT? And the answer is yes. I couldn't resist just mentioning this briefly. So you can use this construction of the coarse grain entropy to prove a Penrose inequality in, uh, in ADS-CFT in the right regime. So here I'm saying apparent horizon. But really, this has to be a space component of a, a space-like outermost component of a holographic screen or a mini Mars surface. And what you get is that the area of sigma is going to be less than the area of a static ADS black hole with mass m. So this is the Penrose inequality in ADS, which again is rather significant because it is often seen as a litmus test of cosmic censorship. Okay, I think I'm starting to run a little bit low on time, so let me conclude over here. So black holes have to have entropy. And this entropy has to be coarse-grained because we expect that it is increasing. So 
How do we deal with this? Well, holographic screens have the same nice properties that make event horizons attractive in the first place. They have an area monotonicity theorem in agreement with the microstate counting arguments in the stationary case. This solved, I would say, a very old problem. The area of space-like holographic screens in black holes is the entropy of our ignorance of the black hole interior. So I would say that we have solved this 45-year-old problem, perhaps in an unconventional way, by simply moving away from the event horizon and instead considering holographic screens. And again, this has a number of nice applications, thermodynamic explanation of the space-like holographic screen area law, proof of the ads penrose inequality, and a few other things I haven't had a chance to talk about. Now, some things on the to-do list. So, oh, sorry, this is actually related to a point that I'm going to make later if I have time. So ignore the first point here. It's related to Rob's question. Um, the second point here is this general addition to quantum correction. So this came up earlier, the quantum corrections issue. Now, in our construction, we were working purely in the limit where we have classical general relativity in the bulk, and we weren't considering quantum corrections at all. Now, there are three people in this room who are working on the quantum corrections of this, uh, of this formalism. So Raphael talked about it very briefly on Monday, and I don't know if you want to comment now, or Arvin or Ven, uh, if you guys want to make a comment regarding the questions that came up, or if we can save this for the discussion. You have the answer answer your talk. Sorry? This, this, this is your talk. All right. So do you add the entropy? Okay. So what, what is the proposal? Sorry? Do you add the entropy? So my understanding, even that the paper hasn't come out yet, and I haven't read the draft yet, but my understanding is that you, um, you add, you consider the generalized entropy instead of the area. So you're looking at the generalized entropy of these minimar surfaces, which are no longer <laughs> marginally trapped by quantum marginally trapped. And, um, and so this is my understanding of the, the way that they, uh, they do it, the, the quantum generalization of this. So this includes this entropy of the quantum fields that you were talking about. So you add them, yeah, you add them. That's right. That's right. Now, there's a question of understanding the boundary anchored version of this. Can we talk about these marginally trapped surfaces that are boundary anchored and ask whether there is a coarse grained entropy corresponding to those? Now, there was a nice paper by Don Meroff and Brianna Greta White where they showed that actually the divergences of the area are not local to such surfaces. So you might worry that maybe this doesn't actually make sense. But when you think about it from our construction, you say, well, you have to fire this null congruence backwards in time and then construct an extremal surface. So in fact, these divergences have to be local to a different region on the boundary. And it might be interesting to investigate if you could figure that out. And finally, so, yeah, so if, 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 this can, uh, if, if we can have this boundary uh, anchored version, if we can understand it, then one other thing we could say is these surfaces, these marginally trapped surfaces are a special case of extremal surfaces. And we could talk about the boundary interpretation of non-minimal area extremal surfaces in this way. There are the issues, the issue of the coarse grain entropy on the boundary. And this was a question that Rob asked, and I will get to it in just a minute. And finally, what about the area law for the timeline component of holographic screens? These are not foliated by minimar surfaces, and we don't have this nice uh, wedges being nested inside one another argument that we did before for understanding where this comes from. So you might be tempted to say, really, you should not think about the timeline component as something physical. You should just snip these holographic screens where they turn from timeline to space like. But it's not that simple. Because you could, have, you could easily have a situation where your marginally trapped surfaces have sort of one leg in the, uh, the space-like region and one in the time-like region, and you can't actually cleanly cut this holographic screen in two. The area law is a, is a monotonicity property of this whole thing, and it should be treated as such, which suggests to me that the, this, this, what we've uncovered here for the space-like component is part of a bigger picture, that the time-like holographic screen is part of this, and we don't understand it yet. Okay, so this is now, we're going, I'm going over time, um, but this is an answer to Rob's question. So I guess uh, if, I'm, if I can, I'll have a, a few more minutes. Okay, all right, Rob. Um, okay, so can we compute the outer entropy from the CFT? Well, to do so, we need to find a way of fixing the outer wedge from boundary data. So and this, uh, this also is uh, the, the, the spoiler that I was worried about. Uh, we need to, this boils down to reconstructing the data on this surface N from the CFT. How can we fix this data? This is what we want to do. Fix this data and then coarse grain over everything else. So let's take some intuition from something like the Vaidya black hole. If the black hole is in equilibrium after n, so in equilibrium over here, then this is the same as reconstructing data in the causal wedge. 
So basically, we just say, oh, OK, this is really just a causal wedge because the black hole is in equilibrium here. And so in this special situation, the outer entropy is just the one-point entropy because you can reconstruct the causal wedge from the one-point functions. Now, this also works if the black hole is approximately in equilibrium. So after it settles down and you're very, very close to equilibrium, you can make a uh, modified version of this argument work as well. But of course, we're most interested in those black holes which are not in equilibrium and are even close to it. So if the black hole is not in equilibrium and S here is significantly far away from our event horizon, then what we, that, that means is that there's matter that's falling across the event horizon. So if we can figure out what that matter is and we can remove that matter, that would have the effect of moving the event horizon up to S and then we could use the one-point functions to reconstruct the causal wedge. So this is roughly the prescription that we propose, that you consider turning off all of the sources that give you matter that's causally propagating across this event horizon. So you take those sources, you turn them off. This is going to move the event horizon up to S and no further by um, the fact that marginally trapped surfaces have to live inside the event horizon and not outside of it. And, that and then we say, OK, now compute the one-point functions, fix the one, now take the one-point functions. Those give you the, cause of the entire causal wedge. And that allows you to recover the entirety of the data on n. So this quantity, which I'm just going to skip briefly through this, um, which is this maximization of the von Neumann entropy subject to turning, on these source, turning off these sources after the time t prime, this is what we call the simple entropy. And our conjecture is that, in general, these two are identical. That if you take this entropy that you get by turning off the sources and fixing the one-point functions, you're covering the causal wedge, that entropy is identical to the outer entropy. However, we can only prove this when the black hole is either in equilibrium or very close to equilibrium. And this is why I had this question earlier. Uh, we would like to understand if this infalling matter can always be removed by these simple sources which propagate causally from the uh, causal wedge from the, the region to the future of T. Yeah, I'm done. Okay. <laughs> Questions? Yeah. Did you actually try to compute the quantum field theoretical contribution to the entropy uh, outside? It, you mean it, when no, including quantum fields in the bulk? Well, I'm not talking about the book. I'm just talking about the contribution from all degrees of freedom outside the horizon. So we were working specifically in the limit where we have just classical general relativity. So we did not consider the quantum fields on the background. But again, there is an upcoming paper um, by Raphael Venn and Arvin, which is, which is supposed to be doing exactly that. My point is that if you try to compute that, like I did, it's divergent. In other words, uh, if you assume the black hole to have a temperature equal to the Hawking temperature, mm -hmm. and you, you could just do classical physics and think that this is just a gas, an atmosphere, like Kip Thorne was talking about, but that atmosphere is divergent on the horizon. So the ent entropy is already infinite as far as the outside of the black hole concerns. So you're talking about the entropy of, ma of, of matter fields. Of matter. The, but, well, but, but just we, we don't, particles. We don't consider this. We, we're not working in the regime where that applies. We're working in an ADS geometry where we have no quantum fields. No quantum fields. Yeah. But the, the problem is that changes everything. Because now, if you do assume quantum fields, you don't need any inside the black hole at all. So, so, so I'm, that, I'm that going changes to let the, the picture the, completely. The folks who are working on the quantum version of this field this question. So um, Van, would you like to answer? I mean, this is why you usually consider the generalized entropy instead of the von Neumann entropy, because the von Neumann entropy is divergent, but the generalized entropy is finite, because the area is also renormalized, and the divergences cancel out. So it's usually OK. Well, I, I, I think the, uh, the, the interior gives quite a bit of problems for a black hole. And so there is a way of phrasing things so that you don't have an interior. And that makes. I, I think it, life I mean, a lot I mean, easier. In this whole prescription, you're agnostic about the interior, right? The whole That's point right, is so to be agnostic about the interior. Be the generalized entropy much. is usually finite, so you don't have to worry about the UV divergences.
also applies in flat space. So for example, when you were talking about large enough surfaces or uh, holographic screens, it was also for. Yeah, that's that. But at some point, is that the only ideas? That, that, that's right. For example, the mini Mars surface, is it also for flat space? Or? Yeah, so you can, so the only place where we use ADS-CFT here is to relate the area of the extremal surface to the boundary von Neumann entropy. If you are willing to say that the area of the extremal surface in asymptotically flat space is in general computing some type of von Neumann entropy, then all this construction still goes through. So the, everything still exists. It's still, it's, it is still correct that the outer entropy is given by the area of an extremal surface in that geometry, which is the same as the area of the apparent horizon of, of this mar, mini Mars surfaces. Um, so, so one of the applications of one of the first applications of the Jane's principle is that you can fix a bunch of expectation values, like the average energy, mm -hmm. or average particle number, and then if you maximize the entropy and you prove that the, that, that the state must be the canonical state. Mm -hmm. is, there, is it crazy to think about what that might correspond to here in the so, sense of... Yeah, that's you know, a good question. So this rela relates to what Rob was asking. Um, and the, because we only have a conjecture about what you have to fix in the field theory in order to know what the, in order to, to fix the outer wedge in the bulk, it's a bit conjectural what this, if you could prove something like, like this, the consequences of this uh, Jane's maximization. Now, if you're willing to take our word for it and talk about maximizing subject to expectation values of these sources, then, um, then certainly you could probably prove something like that. We haven't tried it, but yeah. Uh, so, uh, um, this is a, probably a slightly annoying question, but I really wonder about it. Uh, so, you defined S outer as a hybrid, bulk boundary hybrid, where That's you right. maximize phenomenon entropy on the boundary subject to holding the exterior fixed, ex sorry, outer wedge fixed. That's right. So, um, you can also define this purely a bulk quantity just by replacing the von Neumann entropy with the area of, an HRT, of the HRT surface. Yeah, but if you define it as a purely bulk quantity, then you get to say, I want to only consider ex interiors that are classical. That's but correct. if you just talk about it from the boundary perspective, that would be an assumption. That's right. That's right. Yeah, so is there a way of understanding? It, but it does seem very intuitive that the N minus K construction is giving you the best thing, but is there anything to be said about uh, you know, ruling out that the actually the boundary state with m minimum entropy, maximum entropy, sorry, maximum entropy subject to holding the outer wedge fixed is actually a classical one. I mean, so this, this is our simple entropy proposal that if you fix these, uh, these expectation values, you take these, you turn off these sources, you fix, you fix these sources, if you, if you do that, then you get a state which maximizes the von Neumann entropy. That is the proposal. We don't know how to prove it. So, it, it, yes. m maybe you can cook up a different state which has a larger uh, entropy that would be contradicting our proposal. I see. So can you say something about uniqueness of the geometry you constructed? Mm -hmm. So you gave us one example of a geometry where the inequality is saturated. Yes. But there could be many. Um, there, well, I, sus I suspect that this is the only one. Um, Why is that the case? Um, What's wrong in this picture f yeah. with just sending some particle in from the left that never sort of affects the right in any way? Well, so we construct this by CPT conjugation. What you could ruin if you throw in something from the left is you could create another a situation where there's another extremal surface here, which this ha has area smaller than the area of X. And then you have a, 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 a space time where the von Neumann entropy is smaller. So there's no notion of like doing a unitary on the left will not mess up anything on the right? Uh, I mean, I don't think so, no. Thanks. Yes, I'm also still fascinated by this sort of duality of the arguments that on the one hand you have something that's purely a classical construction, mm -hmm. the bulk, on the other hand it's clearly motivated by ADS. And if I understand it right, I mean, we, we can 
We can certainly define a generalized entropy for arbitrary surfaces in arbitrary space, classical space times or semi classical space times. We can just pick a surface, add the area to the external von Neumann entropy. And there are a lot of results and theorems which you're very familiar with which work when we do that. Yes. And, and so you might think that in every one of these cases, there should be some well defined uh, ensemble in some quantum gravity theory that corresponds to that number, area plus exterior entropy. And, and of course, that's not what happened. So in mm -hmm. ADS, the first case where we understood at least a small class of surfaces for which this happens, those were the stationary surfaces. Mm -hmm. um, and and you've, you've, I mean, you need, first of all, you clearly need a gravity theory to discuss this question. Yes. Otherwise, you can just always declare that, great, you know, here's my generalized entropy, and there's going to be some quantum gravity in which there's, that counts some states. Mm -hmm. so, so, so now you've taught us how to uh, do a coarse graining to marginally trapped surfaces, which are yeah. less restricted, which gets you to some state like that, yeah. where it's again so the entropy of some of some extremal surface. Um, but, but on the other hand, you have these counterexamples where we know in some classes, like take take a surface in in the vacuum, mm -hmm. and you just know the mass is zero, so there's it's always just one state. Yes, there's nothing you can do. How come we're doing so well working with generalized entropy? for arbitrary surfaces, uh -huh. uh, and yet we're having so much trouble assigning an actual ensemble to that number. So I, I, I can give you a personal philosophy on this, which is that um, you can ask, you know, we have an area law for event horizons, or a general, a general second law for event horizons. Maybe this is a, a subclass of what you're referring to. And it's, area laws are hard to come by. And this seems like it should have some kind of a significance. We're able to prove a lot of nice things from the GSL. Uh, so how come we can't give an exp entropic explanation of what the actual generalized entropy is, is computing? And my, my hypothesis is that the GSL is more like a C theorem, where the, it's really what, what's important is that something is increasing rather than what its value is at any given moment. So that you're not actually, you don't care what the value of C is, but you care that it's going up. Could it also be related to, I mean, could it be that in those cases we have a hard time assigning uh, an ensemble to it in the quantum gravity theory, that those are always the cases where the classical part dominates? It's possible. Um, so, for example, the, the event horizon, in, in, when, it, when it's not close to a marginally trapped surface, uh, it tends to be increasing rather rapidly. Mm -hmm. I, that's just... So yeah. are, are you asking if it's possible that the, the main difference here between the surfaces that we're able to interpret correctly and the ones that we don't have an interpretation for is that ones are defined explicitly in terms of this quantity which receives quantum corrections and others are not? I'm wondering about it, but mm -hmm. I, I think the idea of, a, of it being sort of like the C theorem is So, so yeah. by, by that logic, though, you should be able to define quantum normal surfaces and, uh, and, and say, well, sh these should probably have a nice uh, version of the, this coarse grain entropy or something. Um, at least for this particular notion of coarse grain entropy, that's not going to work. You're going to, it's go you're going to get that the generalized entropy of these normal surfaces should be larger than this coarse grain entropy. So maybe there's a different notion, but yeah. One last question. This is a sort of a question or a comment again about the same, the, the same issue of, uh, so, so, so it's true that in the quantum theory that if we look at like the whole vacuum is unique, but if we only know that the energy is zero in some finite region, Mm -hmm. In principle, it's not true that only the vacuum can sit there because it can have negative energy. That, that, that's, that's absolutely right. In the localized region. Now, I, I, it, so, yeah. it sounds like unlikely <laughs> that there will be enough states that would make up the. But, uh, so, so it depends on the region. Are, it depends sure? on the right. on the region. So, I mean, I think you're referring to this rigidity theorem that I was uh, describing. Right, 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 it's, right. It strongly depends on the region. So, so you could certainly say. Um, I could have a vacuum region, a ball of the vacuum, surrounded by some matter. There's nothing wrong with that. But what you can't have is a vacuum region where you put something else inside it. So you can, do, you, you can prove an analog of the positive energy theorem that instead it uses um, the Comer integral instead of the ADMS, where you say that any, any region which is actually the vacuum, which is bounded by the vacuum, cannot contain inside it something which is not the vacuum, as opposed to saying that the vacuum can be surrounded by something which is not the vacuum. That's fine. That's allowed. So, 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 sorry, but I mean, uh, is the theorem you're talking about apply 
uh, even in quantum field theory, mm -hmm. or it's a classical theorem. I, I, I mean, in other words, like we know there exist states in quantum field theory which have negative local energy. Yes. So couldn't I have inside this region some lump of oh, negative so local so energy and positive local energy? So the total energy in this finite region is zero, mm -hmm. and then it would look. Then it could be consistent. So, with so certainly in this prescription, in, in this counterexample that we discussed, we were, did not make statements about the quantum fields propagating. I would say let's work with the leading order in N, and the, but the area of the bifurcation surface is non-zero to leading order. And yeah, that's yeah, where you get a contradiction. I, I, I understand, but I, I, I just meant in, in principle. I, I, I agree uh -huh. it sounds unlikely, but in principle, could, could it be that something like the generalized entropy, like that the area of this surface in empty space d does count the number of states because there are some weird states which have canceling positive and negative energy of the quantum fields inside. I know that sounds unlikely that that gives you enough states, mm -hmm. but is it conceivable? Or? It's possible. Um, as related to one of these results that if like, the, the total ANEC of a state is zero, then that state has to be the vacuum. Right, right, but, but, but those, those statements always involve quantities that you integrate over an infinite range. So in f finite regions, you, you never have such statements. So in, in, in QFT, there's, there's never any quantity. There, you never have bounded operators in finite regions, right? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't have anything to say, anything insightful to say about that at the moment, yeah. Sorry. So it's probably unlikely that that helps, but maybe that gives a small, small entropy, but mm -hmm. not, not the expected one. Wouldn't that violate a bunch of entropy bounds, though? Like, it would mean the vacuum is essentially degenerate, right? You can, you can stay at exactly mass equals zero and vary the state. Um. Yeah, maybe I'm confused. I, mm, right, the total energy, oh, I see. You, you're saying, of course, you just measure the total energy infinity. Yeah. So. Yeah, OK, that doesn't make sense. Then. Yeah, 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 you're right. Yeah, yeah, but outside there's supposed to be none, yeah. Okay, yeah, maybe well, that makes no sense. Including quantum corrections in this discussion? Currently we are. Currently we are. I mean, currently we're discussing quantum states of the fields. Oh. Maybe we should take this uh, uh, yeah, to the... You should probably uh, go ahead and go to lunch uh, so, uh, and continue discussion uh, there. So. Uh,